Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Olivia Ma, and I'm so, so honored to welcome Bob Odenkirk and Tom Hanks today to discuss their roles in the upcoming Steven Spielberg film, The Post, which hits theaters on December 22nd. So please join me in welcoming Bob Odenkirk and Tom Hanks. So, First of all, I just want to thank you all for taking the time to join us here at the YouTube space in New York. Um, it's such an honor and such a timely movie to be discussing today. I also just want to start by saying this is uh, deeply personal for me because my uh, father, uh, my late father worked for a long time as an executive, as an editor and executive at the Washington Post Company. He worked uh, under Kay Graham when he first got his start and then later for his, for his son Donald. And so seeing the movie last night, which I had the pleasure of doing, was, was really, really meaningful. Uh, and so I just want to start by asking about the time of all of this, you know, uh, it's been reported that Steven Spielberg got the script in May, in March, I believe, and then you all started filming in May, and here we are in December, and the film is about to hit the theaters. Talk a little bit about why you felt like it was important to make this movie now, and what the urgency was. I'll go first because I'm hip to some of this stuff, uh, and Bob's not. So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Amy Pascal, who is a producer, read uh, Liz Hanna's draft spec script that was written in. Uh, in October, uh, <clears throat> we read it, uh, and by that I think Stephen and uh, Mara. I don't know when did you read it for the first time? After you, After you board, I don't know. We, maybe, uh, when did it start shooting? Well, we read. I read it in February, and we the first day of shooting was May, which is a brutally short post a pre production time. Uh, and uh, we we uh, my last day was I think the twenty sixth of July, so it shot that fast. But at the same time, Liz. Liz Hanna's screenplay was really about Katherine Graham uh, becoming Katherine Graham. The Pentagon Papers were presented in it as though it was, uh, you know, a, a treasure chest, but we didn't know what was inside the treasure chest. Josh Singer, who wrote uh, Spotlight, among many other things, he ended up teaming up with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Liz because Stephen wanted more information, more details, more of the procedure that went on into this week of American history, so that we were constantly working with uh, new pages, new materials. There were whole scenes that didn't exist until, for example, we met uh, 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 Daniel Ellsberg, uh, who leaked the Pentagon Papers for the Rand Corporation, and there are scenes in the movie that came directly from our, uh, our talk with him. So it was, a, it was greatly in flux from the moment we first read it right up until the, the last day we shot. And Does that answer the timeliness of it, or? Yeah, I mean, and it I, just so happens that we're making a movie that took place in 1971, and if you invert the uh, the integers to 17, it's like we were making a movie about current events. Yeah, there there certainly was a lot of resonance with uh, some of the events that are happening in the world today. Um, talk to me a little about preparing for these roles um, and what the research process was like. You mentioned you had the opportunity to talk with Daniel Ellsberg, who of course was a critical player in this entire story. Um, you know, what was it like to sort of really immerse yourself in the culture of a 1970s newsroom? And well, you knew, yeah. Tom knew Ben Bradley, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I had met Ben Bradley um, through Nora Ephron, uh, and this was years ago, and I act, believe it or not, I actually met Catherine Graham the day she died, uh, that was a fluky thing. Wow. We didn't know that was happening. It's a yet. service you provide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's how deep I was willing to go in the research. Uh, but, wow. uh, but knowing that, there, there is... A, we, they, Catherine Graham wrote this amazing uh, autobiography, um, uh, as, did, as did Ben, and there's oceans of video. There's a lot of material that you can find out uh, about the particulars. But digging into... Uh, the process of the, the pre-Watergate, pre-all-the-presidents-men version of the Washington Post, that was, that was just grunt work. We met an awful lot of people, and we just asked them every possible question we could about how to get the paper out and the importance of this week and the history of it, because it really was an assault on the First Amendment. The New York Times was, I think the word is enjoined or conjoined. They were, they, they were forced to stop publishing by the Justice Department. And the idea of the Washington Post saying, well, we've got, we've got the papers as well, so we're going to do it, they ran uh, flush into the danger of being imprisoned for treason. Uh, for giving up of national uh, national secrets, 
Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm in Lord from that is uh, the, also the background of the paper itself because they were not, the Washington Post at that time was not just competing with the New York Times for national prominence. They weren't even the number one paper in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Washington Star, which never doesn't exist anymore, was the number one paper in Washington, D.C. So you get all this kind of magnificent flexing of journalistic muscles. I mean, you know, Ben Bradley was just... He was a man possessed. He was he was a he was a hunting dog when it came down to doing the work of the Fourth Estate. And Catherine Graham had to deal with the realities of her father started the newspaper, and when he died, he gave the newspaper to her husband, not her. So her husband ran it. Their son Don had actually served in Vietnam and uh, at the at the whims of history. And these these papers. Uh, the study that had been uh, uh, commissioned and had been sitting around the Rand Corporation for, for years divulged just the, what's the word, the rocky road in which American involvement got into this thing that was killing, that was killing about 8,000 young Americans every year uh, and to the total of 52,000, I think, died. So uh, it ends up being this, this treatise on people who understand that they're dealing, they have to have a degree of cynicism because both Ben Bagdikian and everybody in the newsroom and, and Ben Bradley and Kay knew that elected officials lie in order to curry favor and hold on to their power. And yet that cynicism could not give way to uh, a, a, a blanket statement or a desire just to run with anything that is not, that was not the provable codified, uh, research-driven truth that they then ended up finding out. And that's really what the struggle is day in and day out in the six days of I was, the paper. Uh, my research was I read Ben Bagdikian's autobiography, which is a great book. He's a great journalist, gave his whole life to journalism and cared about it deeply, and uh, there's a great YouTube interview with him. And so that how was do you, How cool do you find too. the YouTube? What do you do in order to... <laughs> You got to get one of these fancy computers. It's right here in this building, all the videos that are yeah. right. I'm gonna let's go ask. Let's go down to the library. Pull you out the VHS. You call this building, and a woman goes down an aisle, and she finds the file. Uh, well, actually, I wanted to ask about your your character, Ben Bagdikian, because um, you know he's somewhat a lesser known uh, character sure, in history, yeah. but he had this essential role in actually acquiring the Pentagon Papers from Daniel Ellsberg. And there's an incredible scene. Uh, in the hotel room when you go to actually meet him to, to get the papers and you promise him that you are going to publish them. Yeah, and I wonder if you could talk that about that true. scene. Yeah. yeah, and just like the courage that, that is sort of on, manifested in that, in that moment. I think it's balls, not so much courage because Ben isn't utterly, completely sure that it will get published. He's assuring Ellsberg so he can have the story, but, and he wants it to be published. He thinks it's the right thing to do, I think. But, you know, he, he didn't run the paper, and he knew that whenever you hand stuff over to the, the bosses, even though I think he was tight with Bradley, I'm not sure how long they'd work together, but it seems to me, it seems like they'd worked together for a couple of years, and, uh, and he was a seasoned reporter by the time he got hired there. So I imagine they had a comradeship of years of journalism uh, shared. And, uh, but he, he had to promise Ellsberg he would publish it in order to, walk away with the papers. He also had to take a second set of the papers, which he always felt bad about because it went against his um, rules of being a journalist. Um, Ellsberg asked him to take two copies of the, of the papers, one to give to the Washington Post and one that he secretly gave to a congressman to read into the record, into the congressional record, thereby making it public. And um, after the Washington Post did with, you know, published papers and got in trouble alongside the New York Times, then uh, Bagdikian did deliver the papers to a senator whose name I can't remember, who didn't read all the papers, but he read a chunk. He read a couple hours worth into the congressional record. So there's no, that has to be public. So thereby getting kind of any which way, kind of breaking this code of uh, silence on them. Do you think if, if this moment happened today that journalists working in the environment would, that we're living in today would, would make the same decision? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I think one of the things that has been learned from this checkered period of our, 
our history is that you have to take to the barricades at some point, and they would. Uh, the, what's interesting is the assault that would go on in regards to the First Amendment would not be the same as it was in 1971. At that time, they had the power in order to literally cease the presses from operating and to, uh, making it impossible to literally physically publish the information. Uh, the, what's going on now is uh, a different sort of assault on the First Amendment, a different sort of fight. It is a constant uh, delegitimizing of the truth, uh, which at the same time raises up the legitimacy of what truly is a false media. Uh, you can decry, oh, that's just fake news, that's just fake news that comes out of the, the mainstream media. Uh, but they, are, they go the extra distance in order to have the multiple, uh, multiple sources. And so all of this stuff can be confirmed. And yet there is also, as we know, uh, you know oceans of, uh, of outlets that don't, that don't give a damn about the uh, truth and are forcefully are, 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 are putting out news that they know themselves is false. And in that way, that's a different sort of assault on, let's understand that you could take the First Amendment of the Constitution and maybe not even bother with the rest of them. Because in that First Amendment is we are guaranteed this, the, 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 no government will establish a national religion, so we have freedom of religion. They cannot stop us from a freedom of assembly, which means we get to hang out with like-minded people. We have freedom of speech in order to say anything we want to, short of yelling fire in a crowded theater when there is no fire. And a freedom of the press. You cannot stop the press from alter, uh, from. Uh, from existing, take that. <clears throat> that literally is the foundation for the American democracy and all of uh, all of Western society. When you when you con when you try to conspire in order to attack any one of those um, on any form, you are doing this. You are doing literally the same work of uh, an administration that was truly taking on and putting the the uh, <clears throat> the force of a government behind the ceasing of. Um, of publication and therefore uh, removing the right to uh, uh, the freedom of the press. Yes, I totally agree. I think one, one of my favorite fun facts about you, which I think maybe you should confirm here, is that you send a coffee maker to the White House press corps. Has that happened? Uh, long ago, uh, when I was just a visitor, uh, we visited the empty uh, uh, White House press room and there were, there were like three people there. It has to be staffed 24 hours a day because something goes on, someone's got to be there to turn on the cameras and the microphone and start rolling. And I saw they had the saddest, oldest, shittiest little Mr. Coffee <laughs> that had already been there for like 12 years. And guys, you need a new coffee maker. So I, I sent them a pretty good espresso machine. But that was like 15 years ago. And when I went back and saw it again, it was the same, same espresso maker. I said, guys, come on. So I sent them a new one for, so that they could pursue truth, justice, and the American way. <laughs> And it's, and it's open for everybody. Any, any member of the press corps That's can fantastic. get a, a decent, decent cup of coffee now. That's fantastic. Um, well, Bob, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your decision to take on this role, because your, your career has really spanned a lot of different genres. You've done Mr. Show and comedy, and then, of course, Breaking Bad and yeah. Better Call Saul. What was it like to work with Steven Spielberg on a historical film? It was very intimidating, and I felt, I, I felt out of place. I really did. It didn't and show. It, was hard. it didn't show. Oh, well, we tricked you. We, uh, they used only the good takes. <laughs> That's how they did it. Uh, it was truly, the, I haven't been this intimidated in like 30 years since I first got hired at SNL, where I wrote for this guy uh, when I was 25. Wow. And so it, it's like literally that's how long it's been since I had that feeling that I had on this movie of like, I'm going to be fired. I should be fired. I, I should call them. You should fire me. But it just felt like it was just... Look, you know, I've been very lucky to work on some great dramas on TV, Fargo and Breaking Bad and all, and these are respected projects and great, great creators and stuff, but this was another level, and uh, I've always loved Tom's work so much, and, and Steven Spielberg is, it, you know, it's just, he's an icon, you know, and uh, so it was intimidating, but Steven's very nice, and luckily I played a guy who I could relate to. I think Bagdickian's um, anxious energy coupled with his, uh, in his, in his biography, he talks about learning to fade into the woodwork. That's like a, he learned as a journalist to just quiet himself down to get people to talk. And I thought I maybe was able to combine those using my natural nervousness to both recede away from the camera and then, uh, you know, be, uh, 
energetic when needed. So it was really fun, and I had some comedy in it, too, with the, the nerves of trying to get the phone call to happen because I have some tenuous connection to Ellsberg. Bagdikian actually worked with Ellsberg at Rand, and he sort of put together in his mind who would have uh, the uh, chutzpah to put these papers out, and he chased down Ellsberg, and, and it was a tricky thing to get the papers, and Ellsberg was, you know, scared that he was going to get um, arrested. So there was a lot of tension in my scenes, and I got to use that, you know, use my own natural uh, nervousness to play it. I guess it played well. I feel good about it. And, you know, it, it's, obviously, I think a lot of you have seen the movie. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah, a couple of you. I mean, we're one thing we haven't talked about is Meryl and yeah. um, Catherine Graham. And, and Tom was talking about how that early draft, uh, Liz Hanna's draft, was very much about her journey as a woman to own her power that she'd been given. But she in, internally was like, I don't know if I have a right to this. As smart as she was, as composed as she was as a person, it just was such not, it was so not done and it was so not something she was familiar with uh, that it was hard for her to assume the power that she'd been grant granted and that was hers. And so in this movie, in the course of the story, you watch her grow into that. It's really an amazing thing. Alongside everything that Tom said about the stories of getting the papers and fighting back against the government and getting the crackdown and sorting out this uh, mystery, the suspense, actually, of that, it's a mix of so many things, this movie, and uh, that story is all there from Liz's script. Yeah, I mean, two of my favorite moments are of the movie are when Kay Graham makes the decision on the phone yeah. to, to go ahead and yeah. say, yes, we're going to yeah. publish. And then my other favorite movie it, moment is when we're, she's walking down the steps of the Supreme Court. Oh, yeah. And it's this, you Holy know, she, cow. all of these women are looking at her and yeah. just with a sense of awe and, and inspiration. Here's one of my favorite scenes, not because I just because it works so well. When she goes to that boardroom and she's all prepared, mm -hmm. she's gonna give this presentation and it's all men and they don't, they look right past her as she talks. No one listens yeah. to her. And the way that plays out, you feel it. You feel her being ignored and you're like, yeah. it's crazy it's to moment, watch. And the moment that we're living right now. We're gonna I'm gonna ask one more question then everyone here, please have your questions ready. I wanna ask you, Tom, you know, I was surprised to learn this was actually the first project you'd ever done with, with Meryl Streep. Um, talk about what that was like to work with her, and then if there's other, you know, actors that either of you had, would have always wanted to work with. Well, <clears throat> you, you, you dare not assemble a list, because as soon as you yeah. do, you'll, it'll never happen. It's just, it's just bad luck. <clears throat> and, you know, my, uh, there, we had never just been in projects in which there was a Meryl Streep role that we could go to for her. A go go to her for or and I guess vice versa. I mean, <clears throat> I can't sing a lick, so there was no way I could put myself in Mamma Mia. That that that, <laughs> that, which would have been you know the close I could get. The intimidation factor is truly off the scale. I mean, we 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 knew each other, we met each other. I would say hello to each other, but the the mystery of Meryl is how does she do it? And it turns out she does it just like anybody else does. You know, you, you, you sit, you run your lines a bunch, she starts, she stops, she goes back and forth, she's part of an ensemble, and yet, she, so she does it like everybody else, but she does it unlike anybody else. There's no, there's no way to do it. That, that, that scene <clears throat> where she has it, she's only ever been either the, the daughter or the wife of the person who ran the paper. And that moment where she's getting yelled at, on the phone by people who are saying, under no circumstances can you publish. Well, I don't think you should, because if it was me, I wouldn't. To other people saying, if you don't publish, we're going to resign, because there's no sense of being a journalist if you're not going to run with this. And that decision is placed solely on her. And I, I, <clears throat> uh, my voice is in it. Uh, is, are you on the phone, no. too? No, but you're you're in the it's other room when it's all going on. Yeah. You, you, you threatened to, uh, you threatened yeah, to resign. Threatened to resign. And uh, you don't know what's going to happen. And I think it's one of the, it's, it's a powerful moment in, I think, the history of cinema coming from, she'd hate if I said this to it, but I think the greatest actor who has ever been on celluloid, Meryl Streep. All right, we're going to take a few questions from the audience. There's a microphone here. And yeah, so we'll start with you. Yeah. Hi. 
Okay, thank you guys so much for being here. Big fans of both of you. Um, really, really quickly, Tom, I want to tell you a fast story. My mom is such a huge fan. She was about to give birth to my brother in labor, having contractions while you were about to win the Academy Award. She didn't want to go to the hospital because she wanted to see you win. She went to the hospital after much urging and was able to see you win and then successfully delivered my brother. Wow. So she's a big fan. Uh, is your brother okay? He's alive, I think, uh, yes. That would be my, <laughs> He's my good. Question. His name is Forrest Gump. Yeah. <laughs> um, but huge fans, and so the Just, prelude is... Is your brother uh, smart, or is he... <laughs> is he He's like, very smart. Okay, all right, glad to hear that. Um, I want to ask, I thought that was very eloquent, your description of you know, sort of the changing nature of technology in terms of disclosures back when this movie takes place, and you know currently how a lot of disclosures are affecting politics today. It, it, it's made me wonder, for both of you, you know, has ever working on a movie, especially one that's political like this, really challenged or changed any of your opinions about sort of a strongly health, held belief that you had going into it? Uh, I mostly did comedy in my life, and I made fun of stuff that came from my brain. And so I, I um, you know, I don't, I, I don't have, uh, no, I would say that hasn't happened for me. The, the, the thing that happens when uh, you, 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 you st take on a job because you think you know enough of the story and then in the process of it, you end up learning more and more and more and more until you find out, literally, I, I didn't know that. Um, <clears throat> uh, I made this, when I made this movie called, um, well, most recently, uh, the movie uh, Sully about Chesley who landed the plane out on, on the Hudson, uh, all of the uh, industry and union and NTS, the National Transportation Safety Board pressures that is on somebody who did that, was extremely eye-opening. It made you, number one, maybe not want to fly on a commercial airliner anymore because you find out how little they're paying their pilots uh, and how they cut costs. Uh, but also, uh, he, uh, he, for 18 months, he had no idea if he was going to be found uh, responsible for, uh, for landing the plane uh, the way he did, in which case he would have lost his license and would have lost his, uh, his, his literally, the way that he could make a living. You find that stuff out and you kind of think, really? And yet those are, those are the, you kind of find out these common ordinary details of truth that makes uh, the original reason we wanted to do the movie even kind of like grander because you just find out how much truly is, it's, is at stake. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. So, um, Mr. Hanks, your Instagram is one of my all-time favorites. Um, you do the important work of documenting ephemera around the world. Um, and I was wondering, you've spoken so articulately today about some of the challenges facing, and how do you consider using your platforms and speaking publicly about things that are going on versus doing fun things like that that... Um, just bring a little pleasure to people's lives. Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, do you do you have a big uh, internet social platform? Kind uh, of my presence? my issue is that I I did comedy for 25 years, pretty straight, just that. You no, know? and so I have fans from that world, and it's a very critical world, and they're used to my political opinion. And then I have a larger group of people who've seen me in drama. So even though I spent most of my life with these fans who would completely understand if I made a cynical or crass political comment, I have to be careful because um, I have more fans who don't know I ever spoke up about my opinion about anything and they think I'm a dramatic actor and if I were to say something um, pointed, they might feel insulted and wonder why I'm even commenting so I keep my mouth shut. I'm trying to navigate this thing. I don't know what to do. I think, uh, I think the desire is for authenticity uh, in whatever you put out there. And if, you're, if, if you have eight bajillion followers and you're going to use them in order to sell your new product or steer them towards something that you're actually being paid to endorse, I think that's disingenuous, and it removes the removes the great promise of what all this connectivity uh, was was meant to to provide. I I don't I don't care by and large what most people have to say about the uh, the the issue of the day, or you know it's like this. You remember when the ice bucket challenge came around? Well, that was just a great thing, but you can't create that again. You can't suddenly, you know. 
uh, uh, just by putting it out there make a make something become as important as that. There is a natural kind of like microbiology to all this stuff, and I. I I, uh, when, you know, I don't, I, I put up visual haikus and every now and again, you know, post uh, pictures of, you know, guys I knew who fought in World War II who passed away and just say, Godspeed, thanks for being there. Because I, at the end of the day, I just, I don't trust somebody who uses it for an agenda, be it either self-serving or, you know, coming like you said, saying, uh, oh, I have something important to say about this. I'm not, okay, fine, but I don't have to pay attention to it. Well, thank you, and please thank keep you. doing it. All right, okay. I'll, I, 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 it means you look, gotta look, wander around and look at the ground a lot. You gotta like always be looking down. And why do people always lose pacifiers from their babies, man? There, <laughs> there's millions of pacifiers lying on the streets all the time. I don't know why. Yeah. Well, but I, we, if you, if in order to use them, you gotta run them through your dishwasher. So I like to watch TV with a found pacifier in my <laughs> mouth sometimes. What's it? Hi, I'm Diana. I run a channel about physics, so I have to ask an important question about the universe, which is uh, definitely related. Why do you post pictures of the solo mittens? There's a story behind every one of those mittens. It belonged to somebody. They got it as a gift. They bought it. Sometimes it's an expensive glove. Sometimes it's a cheap one. But I just like to think someone was walking around and... You know, their mind was somewhere else, and they put their glove on, and they walked a little bit more, and they reached for the other one, and where did it go? What's going on in their lives? Why did they do that? And the one that really gets me is little baby booties, when you find a little baby booty. So it means some kid was rolled around in a stroller in the middle of February and probably lost their toes to frostbite. <laughs> you know, they had to go to the emergency room. It was a, it was a big thing. There, there, is, there, is, there is a before and after story that goes along with those, uh, those gloves that uh, I, I just find. Uh, who hasn't lost a glove in this world? And uh, I think it's, it, it unifies us. It's the great promise of social media. It brings, us, <laughs> it brings us all together, doesn't it, in the form of one lost glove or mitten. Thank you for resolving the mystery. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Hanks. Hi. I'm a super big fan, um, and thank you for having us here all here today. So I'm a YouTube creator. Um, my name... I'm from India. Channel name is Rick Shawali. So I don't want to. I can't talk too much. So I'll say it very quickly. So do you think, cause since we're all YouTube creators here, do you think um, is there ever a way that there is a bridge that we creators can ever bridge to traditional cinema? Do you think that's ever possible? Being on YouTube, or what is your view on that? Well, I think you guys are already creating original cinema. Um, I years go by. I think we always get this kind of question of how how can I get started in show yeah. business, you know? <laughs> and the answer is get started in show business. Come up with something and you know put it on. You can use your phone. You can use something decent. How many people actually do create original stories as opposed to things that are going on in their lives? See, um, you guys are. Uh, <clears throat> the 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 nature of how we are entertained is in flux now and it's not going to land for quite some time how we pay for our entertainment is going to be determined and the only <laughs> i think the only guarantee is, is or the only the biggest signpost of it is is going to be the quality of that entertainment. I mean, we all know people that put on different sweaters and they say, I, I don't like the way this sweater, I was hearing a story about somebody who does it like that, and it turns out they get paid in order to put on a certain sweater, what have you. That's commerce, mm -hmm. it's not art. If you're creating original stories out there, it is art, and as people discover you, because you put anything on YouTube, it's going to be there for the rest of time. It will be part of your library. It will be part of your historical output. And you will attract people who are anxious to see what you are going to come up with next. And as soon as they are that, they're willing to pay for that to, to a certain degree. Hopefully. So, uh, I mean, you, you will be able to, anybody who does it and is good at it and pursues it, will be able to attract not only the audience, but someone is out there seeking to have an alliance with you because they want good content and they want <clears throat> they want to take it up to whatever the next level. So I would say there's no individual path to quote unquote legitimate cinema because what's what's the difference between someone who never goes to the movies but instead watches everything on either their phone or their 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 laptop? 
the different, there is no difference. They are seeking entertainment, and they want good entertainment, and they want to be inspired by what you do. So the answer is just keep doing it, and <clears throat> it's going to happen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, I, thank you all so much. We're running out of time, but uh, really big round of applause for Tom and Bobby. Thank you. you. Thank you.